Right? Well, isn't this fellowship is just so sweet and it's um, a blessing to hear the children being catechized. It's a blessing to hear you parents as you're teaching your children to hear them respond and answer even though their answers may not be you know 100% right on with the catechism perhaps not even right really with the question uh, there's always truth to what they say you know it shows us that they are learning and that the Lord is blessing the time of family worship in your families um, I want to encourage you guys in that not that it has anything to do with this particular sermon except that as we've been talking about in the catechism the means of grace being the preached word of God the taught word of God the word of God read and heard not only on Sundays, but clearly in the homes, impresses upon the children, and it's a glorious means of grace. And we're going to be talking about that glorious means of grace today, the means of the preached Word, and specifically the Gospel. Um, I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1, please. We're going to stand and read our text today. Our text today will be Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 10. Now we're going to kind of jump around a little bit surrounding the, the letters surrounding Galatians here, so be ready for that, but we will be reading first Galatians 1, chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Please stand if you're able when you have it, and hear the reading of the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. I marvel that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still striving to please men, I would not be a slave of Christ. This has been the word of the Lord. Please be seated. And as you're seated, please bow your heads, bow your hearts with me as we go to the Lord again in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we've assembled again in this place with our brothers and sisters, and already the fellowship is sweet. I pray that our our singing and our prayers are acceptable in your sight, not by anything that we've done, not, not really even by any, any perhaps even attitude that we've had, but ultimately by the blood of Christ on our behalf, which cleanses us, which seasons us. But I pray also that our heart is, is pure in worshiping you by your Spirit, that you would receive this worship. And I pray that as we're reading your word, as we're, we're listening, as I'm preaching your word, oh God, I pray that you would preach through me by your Spirit, that your Gospel would be heralded today, and that we would begin by seeing the importance of your Gospel for all of life, and that we would see above all the highest mountains, on the highest heights, the beauty of you, O Lord Jesus, our King, and your proclamation, this one true, pure Gospel would you bless the preaching of your word that souls would be saved today? There is nothing that I can do. Nothing. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter how well I speak. It doesn't matter how convincing I am. Nothing will bring lasting change, O oh God, if you do not move by your Spirit through the preached word today. And that is what I'm asking. Would you please use me, a weak man, to save men and women by the preaching of your word and our brothers and sisters who are here, would you use this weak man to edify and to sanctify and to encourage brothers and sisters with the preaching of your gospel, which is life and bread? Would you send forth your Spirit, your Holy Spirit today? Give us ears to hear and eyes to see 
and open our hearts to the beauty, the grandeur, the glory of Your Gospel, the glory of our glorious King, Jesus. Amen. Now, before we really get into the text today, and even before we get to the context of the text today, I want to go back to our Scripture reading from this morning, Romans chapter 1. I'd ask that you turn there, please. Something that just occurred to me as we were <clears throat> sitting here singing, as we were praying, while Brian was giving the update on legislation, perhaps some of you, like me, were more than a little bit overwhelmed at the state of things surrounding us. You ought to be. If you're really paying attention, it ought to stir you and concern you what's going on in the world today. Yesterday, we kind of rallied the troops back at 16th Street in Indianapolis. We had a good group of our people there to stand and intercede for the preborn. Probably upwards of 70 babies died yesterday. And it's been a while since I was out there. It was overwhelming to see that we are fighting a monster. We're fighting, we're fighting dragons. And it's, it's overwhelming to see the odds, the, 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 the strength of our enemy. I mean, you're standing out there and you're having people being mocking you, mocking your gospel, dancing after they murder their child. And you have people in our state who are trying to corrupt and successfully corrupting our children, and perhaps not our children, but our neighbors and our neighbors' children. And there's evil in our land, and as, as Brian rightly pointed out, we are living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and our people, our people are a blight and an abomination before the Lord, and we are a part of that people. And you look at the evil that's going on, and you're overwhelmed. But we read this. This is for the saints. This is for the world. How can we bring about change? How can we bring about justice in the world? How can we please God? It is through this. For I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I want you, as we're considering these things, and we're going to be talking about the true gospel, the only gospel, the precise and pure gospel. We're going to be warning about false gospels. I want you to see here what we have plainly before us, which is that we are overwhelmingly overpowered except that we have this one Word, which is the Gospel of God. It is the very Word of God. It is the power of God. The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And this is not just as it applies to the lost world. It is not just as it applies to those who are far off, those who are engaging in evil. But listen... We talked about this in our Sunday school lesson. In verse 15, Paul is so anxious to come to the Roman brothers to meet them, to impart a spiritual gift to them, to be mutually edified with them. He says, in this way, for my part, I am eager to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. He wasn't writing to lost people. He wasn't writing to pagans. He was writing to his brothers. And he is eager to proclaim the gospel to his brothers. Why? Did they not have a full gospel? Were they not truly saved? Has the Spirit not come? No. These are brothers who were known throughout the world, throughout the Christians throughout the world, for their faith and their their strength in the faith. So why is he coming to bring the gospel? Because the gospel, the power of God for salvation to those who believe is for everyone and for all of life. It is not only for those who are lost to be saved, it is not only for those lost sheep in the wilderness to be called back to the living God, but it is for you sheep in his pen and in his hold and in the hold of his hand to be strengthened and edified to be uh, reminded. Why do we take the table? Because we need to be reminded of the body and the blood and the death of our Lord. And so, it's easy for us, I've talked about this before, to scoff at the preaching of the Gospel again, saying, I already know these things. But this is the most needful message for us to be reminded of the beauty, of the glory, of the purity of the Gospel. 
of the precise and, and exclusive gospel. And so I pray this morning that you all are fed through the preaching of this gospel. Now, as we prepare to go to Galatians, we need to do a little bit of, uh, a little bit of digging of some context here. So the context leading up to the letter, uh, Pastor Cam alluded to this last week in his, in his sermon as he was preparing the, the road that we're going to travel through Galatians. There's really two schools of thought with regarding who is receiving this letter. Uh, the first is that it's regarding or being delivered to the northern, uh, a northern people in northern, the northern region of Galatia. Uh, I'm of the second group. I'm going to kind of hang my hat here that's saying this is going to the churches in the southern region of Galatia. These are the people that we follow in the first missionary journey to Acts. These are the first people that Paul brings the gospel to that we read about. Uh, we see this taking place in Acts chapter 13 and 14. Uh, we see that Paul goes from Antioch, he with Barnabas, goes from Antioch uh, in Syria, a region in Syria, through a few islands. Uh, John Mark leaves them, and eventually they get to a place called Pisidian Antioch, which is in the southern portion of Galatia. If you have a map in the back of your Bible, it would be helpful to see that, to kind of map out what he does here and who he's writing to. But he spends much time in these cities, in Pisidian Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, and Derbe. Um, when he gets to Pisidian Antioch, he, he proclaims the gospel there to the Jewish brothers, and he's eventually run out of there. He's run out to uh, Iconium. He's run out to Lystra and Derbe. He and Barnabas go from city to city to city, preaching the gospel. They spend much time there, it's said, uh, and then they're eventually run out by those who would seek to destroy them. Uh, eventually, Paul is, is stoned and left for dead in Lystra and Derbe. We read that at the end of chapter 14. And the Lord miraculously raises him up. Uh, he very well might have died, and the Lord might have resurrected him, or he was near death, and the Lord healed him. But the point is that he was raised back up, and he travels with Barnabas back into that city that tried to kill him, and he seeks to edify the saints there. And then they, they travel back the same way they came, all throughout the, the, the cities there, to encourage and strengthen the saints. In verse uh, chapter 14 of Acts, verse 21 and 22 tells us, after they had proclaimed the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many afflictions, we must enter the kingdom of God. So we see here, this is Paul's first missionary journey. We see the strugglings. We see the, the sufferings that Paul endures in these cities, these cities in the southern region of Galatia. And eventually they come back to their sending church in Antioch, the Syrian region in Antioch. There are two Antiochs, if you didn't know. And in Acts 15, verse 1, it says, Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This leads to much debate, and eventually a few people are sent to Jerusalem to go consult with the rest of the brothers, the rest of the apostles, which leads us to the Jerusalem Council and the rest of Acts 15. What we can glean from this is that false teachers were already making their way up from out of Jerusalem, which is kind of the central hub of Christianity at that time, and it's going out into all the world. They were making their way up even into Syria, uh, they were going north at that time and, and north, uh, northwest, uh, teaching lies and, and twisting the scriptures. And eventually, we can say the little doubt that they made their way to this region in Galatia, kind of following after Paul. And so, quickly after that, uh, Paul goes on his second missionary journey. As he goes on his second missionary journey, he separates from Barnabas and he goes back to the cities in Galatia to encourage them. And around that time, we can assume perhaps this letter was written. Now, again, there's much debate. There's some people who would debate that, say it was written a little bit later, perhaps even earlier. Perhaps it was written to a different group of people. I'm just telling you this now, that this is the foundation that I'm going to be building off of when we're reading through this, when we're going through Galatians. I'll be building off of this idea that this follows very quickly after Romans 13 through 16. And if you're reading through those, you're studying through that, you can kind of see the roadmap that I'm going to be taking to get us there. Now Paul, finally getting to our Galatians, he writes to the brothers in the church in Galatia. And he remarks, he says, I marvel that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. 
He says, I marvel. He remarks his disbelief at how quick the Galatians were deceived and abandoned the faith of the true gospel. He's astonished. He's amazed. This is the same word that's used in Matthew 8.10 as Jesus marvels at the faith of the centurion when he says, my, my son is sick, my son is dying, come into my house. Jesus says, I cannot come. He says, then just say the word and I know my son will be healed. For I command many and they go. I say this and they do it. And Jesus marveled at the centurion's faith. This is the same word. He was amazed. He was astonished. He admired the centurion's faith. This is the same word used in Matthew 8, verse 27, when the disciples marveled at Jesus when He rebuked the winds. They're on the boat. They're setting sail. They're saying, Jesus, we're going to die. Don't you care? And He says, you of little faith. He rebukes the winds and it stills. And they marveled. What man is this? That even the wind obeys Him. It's that same emphatic, that same uh, amplified surprise that we see here from Paul. I marvel that you so quickly desert Him. That you're so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. So this is what we see here. We, we can see, leading up through Acts, the kind of gospel that Paul preached. We can see in Romans the kind of gospel that Paul and the Christians believed and preached that ministered to their souls. This was a gospel that was not only good news. It wasn't something that they only gave mental assent to and said this is, this is the best option. It's not as though Paul was just surprised that they went a different direction because it's a lesser option or it takes more work. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that Paul would die for and perhaps died for. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is one that they've had a living experience with that has changed their life. They have known the changing work of the gospel, what it means to be born again. And so Paul says, I marvel that you've left this thing, that you've left not only this gospel, but Him who called you. You see, to, to abandon the one true and pure gospel for any other distorted gospel is to abandon the one true and living God. You see that. We see two principles from this verse that there is only one gospel. He says you are quickly deserting Him who called you for a different gospel, which is really not another. There is no other gospel. There is only one good news. There is only one power of God unto salvation to those who believe. There is only one. It is exclusive. There are not different flavors for different preferences. There is one gospel. Any other gospel, any other change, any other compromise is a perversion, a distortion, and it is another gospel. It is a lie. And there are those that were in Galatia, it says, who would seek to distort the gospel, were disturbing the saints. But we see here again, there's one gospel, and to entertain anything besides that one gospel is not only to abandon truth, but to abandon the one and true living God. You will exchange your master for a liar, for a slave driver, if you abandon this true gospel. And he goes on. He's emphatic here. So what we see here is a warning. It's a rebuke. But it's, it's a warning of the the subtleties of a false gospel. It's a warning of the dangers of a false gospel that this will kill you. This will not only disturb you, this will destroy you. And it is so destructive, this subtle little shifting, this subtle little compromise. It is so destructive that Paul says, verses 8 and 9, it's so emphatic that he calls a curse on these people. He says, even if we, that is, the Apostle Paul, Barnabas, all of the brothers who are with him, even if we who came to you and proclaimed this gospel, even if we who came and ministered among you and taught you and raised you up and helped build these churches, even if we came to you and said, we made a mistake, we missed something. Even if we, the apostles who have the authority to raise up churches, or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel that is contrary to the gospel that we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. 
anathema. The word is damned. Let him die and burn in the pit of hell. He says again, as we've said before, so I say again now, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. Now again, there's two things we should pull from here. There's a matter of authority. There's a matter of authority throughout this whole book that in the book of Galatians you have a contending with two authorities. We see this also in the Corinthians. But you have an authority who has set themselves up against Paul. And this is the perception for the Galatians, that it's these Judaizers, this Judaizing heresy, this authority that's come from Judea perhaps, that's come in and said, you must be circumcised, you must add the law and the prophets, you must add the systems of the Old Covenant. And they have their own authority. And they're putting themselves up against Paul. So it's Paul against the Judaizers. But really what we see here is that it's the Judaizers against the living God. You see, Paul takes himself out of the argument in verses 8 and 9 when he says, even if we come to you with a different gospel, we are to be damned. We see here that the true gospel is not authoritative because of the authority of the one who proclaims it. The true gospel is not the true gospel because the apostle Paul preached it. Rather, the ones who proclaim the true gospel are given authority because of the gospel they preach. You understand? So that's why Paul can say, if I come and tell you I missed something, if I come and tell you that you need to keep the law, I'm a liar and I should be damned, don't listen to me. Paul's apostleship comes from Christ. His authority comes from the Word of God. The Gospel gives him the authority. The Lord Jesus Christ gives him the authority. And if he deviates from either of these things, he doesn't have the authority to change them. And he proves himself to be false. And if an angel comes, a spiritual, majestic, glorious angel comes and says, no, you've missed something. He's a liar. He's to be cursed. He's to be damned. Joseph Smith. He says, let him be accursed. He says, to the one who deceives even one of these little ones that changes a jot or a tittle of the law of God, of the gospel of God, any of these who would distort it doesn't even have to be an outright denial, but a distortion, a, a slight change, a compromise of the pure gospel of Christ. If anyone does this, let him be cursed, let him be damned, let him be so devoted to destruction as Judas the betrayer himself, as Jericho the city, which when it was cast down was cursed to never be built again and has only been trodden underfoot ever since. Anyone who would come to you that would preach a different gospel than the one pure and true gospel should be destroyed and forgotten to history. And here we have, as I said, the clashing of two different authorities, two different gospels. The church is caught in the middle. We see kind of this warning of the insidious subtleties of false teachers, the, the harsh reward that awaits their trickery. This is a warning saying, don't even listen to a one. Flee from a one who would change, who would distort the gospel. So let's dive into this a little bit further. What are the two gospels that are kind of being brought to war with one another? What is the heresy of the Judaizers? What can we glean from the scriptures here? What's being warned about? And then, so what's being warned about here and how can we apply that to our own lives? What should we beware of? So you see here first, the heresy of the Judaizers. It's a, a, subtle, a subtle distortion a subtle perversion, as verse 7 tells us. There are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel, want to just change it a little bit, want to bend it a little bit to fit their scheme. And as we can see, again, if it matches up well with the scheme in Acts, this likely can be traced back to certain men in Jerusalem. Certain men who were even perhaps associated with Peter. As we read in Acts, there were certain men who were near to Peter of the, of the, the circumcision party. So this, they likely appealed to the authority of certain men in Jerusalem. And again, we talk about authorities here. Paul extensively mentions Jerusalem, how in chapter 2, how he only spent a little bit of time with the apostles there. He's a distinct authority from them. And we see Acts 15, they eventually go to Jerusalem because that's where this, this controversy came from. They make their decision. We see a heavy emphasis then on keeping the law. 
as a part of purifying salvation. We see in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, Paul writes to the Galatians, we'll talk about this a bit later, but this gives us an idea what he's writing against. He says, O foolish Galatians, who bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to know from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by faith? You see, there's this, this emphasis that, yes, you have the Spirit. Yes, you have the Gospel. Yes, you believe in faith, but you need to be circumcised. You need to keep the law. You need to be made a Jew. You need to be made a, a Hebrew, an Israelite. You need to keep the, the, the Sabbaths and the festivals. That's what it means to be saved. They're requiring a submission to the Mosaic Law and the ordinances with days and festivals, all beginning with circumcision. And we can see that clearly because chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 tells us, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore stand firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. What's he saying there? What he's saying there, again, we'll talk about this when we get to chapter 5. What he's saying there is, if you receive circumcision as a means to be purified, as a means to be saved, as a means to be beloved of God, then you don't know the true gospel. Then you have no place with God. There is nothing that you can do to please God. It must all be Christ for you and in you and through you by faith. And we'll talk about this in a moment in the subtleties of, of modern false gospels, modern heresies. But we see here, this is one thing I want you to know, that false teachers, oftentimes, most oftentimes, are not malicious men who are trying to destroy churches, right? That's not their aim. That's what happens. But what they're really trying to do is bring what they perceive to be truth. They believe that this is what needs to be done. The people of this, of this party believe that these people needed to become Jews to be saved. And you can't really fault them because they've had a thousand plus years of this tradition of proselytizing Gentiles. You want to come and be a part of Christ's family? You want to come and be a part of God's people? Well, you must be circumcised. You must keep the family. You can be uh, an outsider or a sojourner, but you have to keep these things, these letters of the law. And so they were sincere. False teachers are usually sincere. They're usually convinced of the things that they believe. And normally, it's not an outright or overt denying of the gospel, but it's an emphasis, a heavy emphasis on one true aspect of the gospel. Didn't Jesus say that not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away? Christ did not come to nullify the law, but to fulfill the law through him. Well, we should keep the law then. We should keep the Mosaic law. We should be having these people be circumcised. Christ said nothing will fall away from the law. He won't do away with the law. And so they focus on that one thing. You see, they overemphasize. They put too much weight and not only does it become a distortion, not only does it become an unbalanced view, it becomes a false gospel. We'll see in a moment how that's happening in our modern day, in our modern context, how we need to be aware. But let's look at Paul's true gospel. Paul says his gospel is not a yoke of slavery. It's not to be kept through the law. You cannot be saved by keeping the law. It's not based on your performance. You're not an ox tied to a yoke. He says it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, stand firm. Don't put yourself under the subject of a yoke. Don't become a slave to the law. It was for freedom. And we've talked about that before, but our freedom is not licentiousness to live in sin. Our freedom is not to throw out the law. Our freedom is to lovingly keep the law as Christ has commanded. But we don't keep the law to earn God's favor. We keep the law because we are favored. You see the difference? More on that as we uncover the rest of Galatians, I'm sure. But he says his gospel, it's, it's a pure gospel. It's a gospel of freedom. It's a gospel of faith and not works. It's a gospel of fulfillment. And Paul will detail and explain all these things as we go through the letter. And I pray that as we open up this letter, that the glory of the gospel is opened up to our eyes, that we can rest in these things, that we can rejoice in these things, that our eyes can be illumined to the grace of the gospel. Even us who have been walking with the Lord for many years, that this, this, this fresh 
outpouring of fresh and pure water from the Spirit may be washing over us, may fill our souls, and we praise God in truth. But we want to ask what kind of gospel did Paul preach? We can see it here in Acts chapter 13. I'd like you to turn there, please. Acts chapter 13, verses 15 through 41. This is the gospel proclamation that Paul gave when he was in Pisidian Antioch. Paul is there in this place and he settles down on the Sabbath day in the synagogue and the synagogue officials read the law and the prophets as they do and they say, brothers, if you have any words of exhortation for us, say it. And in verse 16, Paul stands up and motioning with his hand, he said, men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen, the God of this people Israel chose our fathers and lifted up the people during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. And for a period of about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And when he destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their lands as an inheritance all of which took about 450 years. After these things, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And after he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, about whom he also said, bearing witness, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the seed of this man, according to the promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had preached before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was fulfilling his course, he kept saying, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. But behold, one is coming after me, of whom I am not worthy to untie the sandals of his feet. Brothers, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, To us, the word of this salvation was sent. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found no ground for death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. And when they had finished all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, and the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we proclaim to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers, that God has fulfilled this promise to our children, and that he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. But that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and faithful loving kindness of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not give your holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served the purposes of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through him forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and that in him everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. Therefore, watch out so that the things spoken of by the prophets may not come upon you. Look, you scoffers and marvel, and perish. For I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should recount it to you. Amen. This is the gospel that Paul proclaimed to these people. This is a gospel of what? This is a gospel of the majesty of God, the power of God to choose a people, to raise up a people, to bring a people out and save them from Egypt, to deliver them a king. This is a God who has done these things powerfully. He's done these things and Israel didn't deserve any of them. He did them of his own accord. He did them because it pleases him and because he loves these people. This is a a gospel of a God who makes promises and keeps them. He makes promises and fulfills them himself. This is a gospel of a God who raises his beloved son from the dead 
to declare that He is His beloved Son. This is a gospel of redemption. Redemption from the condemnation of the law. The Jews knew that they deserved to die. The law condemned them. And what does Paul say? Paul says, Let it be known to you, brothers, that through Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and that in Him everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. The law of Moses can do nothing but condemn. The law of Moses can do nothing but enslave. It is a good law, but it works out in our sinful hearts to bring about death. And Paul is saying, praise God that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, kept the law for you and justified all who believe in Him. There is nothing you can do to be justified. He has done it all. Do you believe that, Galatians? That's the gospel he's proclaiming. A gospel of fulfilled promises. A gospel of God's power and man's weakness. A gospel of God fulfilling everything he said he would do. A gospel of men resting in the sovereignty of God and glorifying God for his power. Of praising his name that they are no longer slaves. The gospel of Jesus Christ is perfect pure and true. It is precise. And we have to be precise. As the Puritans said, many of the Puritans were scoffed at. Many of them were, were, were scandalized because they were too precise with their doctrine. And one responded, well, we serve a precise God. We must be precise with our gospel proclamation. We must be precise and accurate as to what the Scripture says is the good news of the New Testament. Now, as we go back to Galatians, Pastor Cam explained last week how Jesus Christ, as it says in verse 4, gave Himself for our sins so that He might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. And Pastor Cam explained that that present evil age that Paul then was talking about was this dying Jewish system, this old covenant system that was a yoke of slavery, a yoke of slavery in this world. These men were at that time in bondage to the whims of dead men, though they live and breathe, and dry bones, perverting the old covenant system that Christ Himself fulfilled and therefore perverting the new covenant gospel. And He's saying, Christ died to save you from that, to save you from that condemnation, to save you from that bondage. And now in the same way, we today are in this same world, in our own age, and we are still being freed from much of the same kind of bondage to the wicked who would pervert God's perfect word and command of the gospel. In the days that Paul was writing, it was the Judaizing heresy, it was the, 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 the Jewish people that were passing away, the, the Jewish leadership, those who were apostate and would not see Christ for who He is. Even up to the time of the Reformers, for Luther and the Reformers, that evil age, that evil system was the Roman Catholic Church which perverts the gospel. It perverts the gospel. In fact, it has no gospel. All it says is that Christ died, and if you're baptized, you get a clean slate. But you have to keep the sacraments. You have to keep penance. You cannot commit these sins. You have to keep the mass. All of these things, it's a yoke. There's a reason why Luther loved Galatians so much. Because he saw the freedom of the gospel here. Because he was in bondage to that evil system of Rome. He, in fact, hated God. Why did he hate God? Because he saw God's holiness. He saw God's holiness and he saw how, how terribly wicked he was. He saw that he could never please God, no matter how much money he gave, no matter how much he suffered, no matter how much he beat himself. There was no way this pure and holy, undefiled God could love and forgive a wretched sinner like him until he read Galatians. And he saw that Christ did it all. He did not do it in part. He did it all. And Luther was freed. It's the spark that began the Reformation that brings us to where we are today. And the same thing for the Puritans. The Puritans fought against the Roman Catholics and they fought against the, the overpowering, overstepping hand of the crown as well. That would bring a bondage upon their conscience as to how they would worship. But now, closer to home, closer to our day, see those things are still true. The Roman Catholic Church still has a wide grip 
a vice grip and a reach on people's consciences. People are under the yoke and bondage. They don't know the good news that Christ has done the work for them. We can punch at the Roman Catholics all day and I'll get yes and amen, but there are a few things that are closer to us that need to be exposed and examined. So let me say this. I'm going to give you four examples of drawn to their farthest conclusion false gospels that we are all exposed to. And as I said before regarding the Judaizers, these men were sincere. These men believed what they preached. Some of them probably wanted to destroy the church, but probably not all of them. We see here that it's very possible for many of them there was an overemphasis on a true doctrine, the validity of God's commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. The validity of those things. And we see how that overemphasis perverts, distorts the gospel, becomes no gospel at all. It is the same thing for these four, what I'm going to call heresies. So we have two pairs. One is what I'm going to call the Pentecostal heresy. And again, that's kind of easy for most of us to punch at. So I'm going to give you guys another one for our nice, fun, reformed boys after that. But the Pentecostal heresy... The, now, again, not all Pentecostals, not all Charismatic Brothers say this, but it is prevalent throughout their denominations that many say you must speak in tongues to know that you have been saved. You must experience the gift of tongues. They can't really define. And if you haven't experienced the gift of tongues, you cannot be certain that you've been saved. In fact, you probably haven't be sa- been saved because the Holy Spirit hasn't come upon you. And again, as I said, not all charismatic brothers, not all Pentecostal brothers will hold to this. I know faithful uh, assemblies of God, old men, who I disagree with vehemently on many of their doctrines, but they are brothers, and they repudiate this on every turn. Their discernment has some issues, and we have those conversations, but, but those men who have been a part of my life, and, and I love them dearly, they're brothers. So not all charismatic Pentecostal people believe this. Don't hear what I'm not saying, but it's there. It's prolific. It's prevalent. And in fact, it's enslaving to many of the people who sit underneath this preaching. I've spoken to many who have no certainty that they are known by God because they haven't received the Holy Spirit. They're under a yoke. This perverts and emphasizes the New Testament use of miracles, which at that time were a sign of authority for Jesus' apostles as speaking Jesus' words. There's a reason why when Paul went into a new place, he proclaimed the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles. Miracles followed him because God was testifying that this word is true. And it was a sign that God was grafting in Gentiles. We see that throughout Acts. Whenever the gospel goes to a new people group, we see it in Acts 2. When it comes to Jerusalem, people speak in tongues. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is coming to that Jewish people, that people in Israel, and it's being shown. And then it goes out to Judea, it goes out to Samaria. When it comes to Samaria, the gospel comes, people believe, they receive the Spirit, they speak in tongues. Why? Because God is showing that the Samaritans are a part of this covenant people. Praise God. And then it goes out to the centurion, Cornelius. Not the centurion, but Cornelius. Peter comes into his home. A Gentile and a God-fearer, he comes in and he preaches the gospel. And the Holy Spirit comes and they, they speak in tongues. Why? Because God is saying that even the Gentiles are a part of this same one covenant people. It's the same sign throughout until it goes out to all the peoples of all the world. That's why we don't have to expect the tongues to come when the Holy Spirit comes, when the gospel is proclaimed, because every people group has been accounted for, as it were. The Jews, the Samaritans, the God-fearers, and the pagan Gentiles have all been shown to be a part of this covenant group. We're all part of the family if we're in Christ. But these brothers, and some are brothers, some are deluded brothers, but many are people like the Galatians, like the Judaizers, they pervert and overemphasize this need for miracles and really a desire for miracles into something that it's never meant to do, to signify if God has actually saved an individual. This is not a gospel of faith. This is certainly not a gospel of faith in Christ alone. No matter how many people say that they have faith, I mean, I have faith, that's why I can speak in tongues. No, you have faith in nothing but yourself. It is a gospel of faith in their own ecstatic uh, experiences. They don't rest that Christ has finished the work for them. They can't rest if they haven't spoken in tongues. And if they have spoken in tongues, they rest in the fact that they've spoken in tongues, not that Christ has done the work for them, not that Christ has finished the work for them, not even that they're found in Christ, 
They don't know what spirit they have. They rest in the fact that they've experienced something. And that is no foundation but sand. And it's a false gospel. Now, Reformed brothers, it's your turn. What about the doctrinal perfectionists? Do we have any of those in the congregation today? This view that's prolific throughout the modern Reformed boys movement. Now again, I said, we serve a precise God. We can't be sloppy in our doctrine. We must endeavor to be precise. We must dive into the scriptures, search these things out, and see how all of God's word marries up together to form one cohesive thread, one story, one line of reasoning. God's commands do not contradict one another. We must be precise. And we must be meticulous. But we must also understand that God is very, very gracious to us. God is very merciful to us. We are, especially the Post Mill brothers would say, we're still very young in church history. There is much we don't know, certainly, like we do for the doctrine of the Trinity, like we do for the doctrine of Christ's deity. There are things that we are still working out. But there is a view that has come in And again, it's this overemphasis on the need to be precise, the desire to stand for truth. It's founded on good principles, but it swings the pendulum too far. And essentially, it gets to the point where our brothers who say this and eventually get to this point, or who who perhaps maybe aren't brothers, they would say, essentially, one's not truly a brother, or one's not as sanctified of a brother as they can be, unless he's a card-carrying, confessional, Calvinistic, cessationist brother, or whatever your pet doctrine is. And the gospel here then is not a gospel of faith at all. It's a gospel of mental acumen. It's a gospel of learning and theology. You have to have your doctorate to be a Christian. It's not a gospel of faith in Christ alone and His finished work. It's a gospel on your own ability to grasp theology and make it fit together in the puzzle. And the fact is you're probably wrong at one of those points. So you can never be certain if you're saved. It's no gospel at all. And again, don't hear what I'm not saying. We must be precise. We must desire to be precise. But we also must be humble. And we must praise God that He is merciful to us and to our brothers. What about this? This one that's sweeping throughout Protestant Reformed evangelism the cheap grace gospel of the last century. Or, as a lot of people like to call it, once saved, always saved. If you've been saved, you're going to be saved for sure. And again, we as good card-carrying Calvinists will brussel against that. We believe in God's keeping of His saints. We don't believe in this kind of doctrine which does this. It perverts salvation by grace through faith, by perverting faith. It distorts faith. And it gives a false assurance to people who have never been born again. It replaces living faith with a dead, fleeting, mental assent to a very, a very convincing sales pitch. This is a false gospel that expects no change in the life of a rebel sinner, and it deserves to be repudiated. It deserves to be damned, just like Paul said of the Galatian heresy. You do not get to raise your hand and enter to heaven. You do not get to pray a prayer and repeat after me and enter into heaven. You must be born again. That is what the Lord Jesus teaches. You must be given a new heart, a heart of flesh. And what this gospel teaches, this cheap grace gospel, is as long as you prayed that prayer, you can be certain that you belong to God. It doesn't matter if you're sleeping around on your wife. It doesn't matter if you're lying to your parents and leaving the house. It doesn't matter if you hate the things of God. You can cling to this profession of faith and a baptism that we gave you when we didn't actually preach the gospel to you. It's a lie. And millions of people, I say, will go to hell because of it. And they'll go to hell thinking that they're right on the right train. It deserves to be damned. But what about this? This is really, if the last one, doctrinal perfectionism didn't get you guys angry, what about lordship salvation? Now, again, this has been a response to the abuse of that cheap grace gospel. 
that dead gospel. It's a response to the abuses and sinful neglects of that movement, their defense of the carnal Christian. It's a response to the Christian that would say, Jesus is my Savior, but He's not my Lord right now. I haven't made Him my Lord yet. I'm still a Christian, but Jesus isn't my Lord. And rightly it says, no, Jesus is Lord. So repent, flee from your sin, and believe the gospel. Now, if that's as far as it went, that would be 100% the true gospel. Jesus is Lord. He is the Lord of all of you. He is the Lord of you even if you're not a Christian. But the problem is the pendulum swings too far. It's a response to abuses. And as we do, we're reactionary. We're reactionary conservative reformers. We rode the pendulum to the other extreme. You see, we would quote John 14, 15 and say, If you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love Jesus, you will love Him as your Lord. You will keep His commands. But the problem is, for many in this camp, and I'll tell you, probably many of you sitting here would, would assent to this idea of lordship salvation without understanding how far the pendulum has swung. You would readily amen the fact that Jesus is Lord and we must obey Him. And I do too. But the problem is, as far as it's gone, it distorts the gospel in this view because God's love, an attempt to emphasize His holiness and His dread, and God is fearful. You must fear God. God is still holy. In doing so, in emphasizing those things, it perverts actually God's holiness and it denies essentially His love. That's the trap. We can't talk about God's love for His saints. We can't talk about God's love for sinners who are wrestling with sin and who are really wondering if they belong to God because they haven't mastered this thing. They're wrestling with sin. They hate their sin. And we emphasize God's holiness saying you must mortify sin. You must hate sin. And it gets to the extreme where these people who hate sin but haven't been given victory yet wonder if they truly belong to God. They wonder if God loves them. They wonder if God hears them. They wonder if they belong to Christ. And as far as it goes, it leads away from a gospel of faith in Christ's finished work on our behalf because it, it relies on a faith that we can be obedient enough to please the Father. And really, when it goes to its fullest extreme, it comes full circle to the Galatian heresy. No, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved but you got to love Jesus as your Lord and you got to do it consistently throughout your life. No mess-ups. These men take off and spurn the robes of white which are for sons and daughters and they put on slaves' clothes again. They forget what Jesus says. They love John, what is it, 14 verse 15, but they forget what Jesus says in John 15 verse 14. He says, You are my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard from my Father, I've made known to you. Now that's our Lord. That's also our beloved elder brother who has brought us into his family. He's taken the yoke off of us. We must worship him with fear and reverence. But we must also worship Him with faith, knowing that you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to keep the law enough. You're never going to love the Lord enough. You're never going to submit to Him as your Lord enough. And yet, He loves you still. That's the true gospel. All four of these are traps. And in their, their infant stage, their, their false teachings, their distortions, but when they get as far as they get, they are false gospels. And this shows the insidious, subtle nature of false teaching. It's not always just a denial of Jesus Christ as deity. Sometimes it's an emphasis that Jesus is Lord. Sometimes it's an emphasis that Jesus is loving and merciful. So we must be on guard. These are incomplete Gospels, and therefore there are no Gospels at all. All of these Gospels, when taken to their extreme, they lead to a dead orthodoxy or a dead licentious life, living for sin, and filling up on filth. 
And ultimately, they will lead dead men and women clinging with a dead hope to a dead faith to the grave and to hell. Which is why we must know the true gospel. We must hear the gospel and live by the grace of God alone with a living faith. What is the true gospel? I'll give you a few passages and we'll expound because you need to hear. Remember Romans 1. Paul wanted to go to Rome to encourage the saints, to uplift the saints. How? Not just by being there, not because he was an apostle, by preaching the gospel to these brothers. The gospel is for you, saints, and it is also for the lost sheep of Christ's flock. Acts 17, verse 24, you can follow along with me there. Acts 17, 24. Paul is speaking in Athens to the Athenians who have set up an idol to the tomb of the unknown God. And he said, The God who made the world and all things in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He served by human hands as though He needed anything, since He Himself gives to all people life and breath in all things. And He made from one man every nation, of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He's not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are His offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to suppose that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the craft and thought of man. And we stop there. What's Paul going on about? He's talking about the one true living God. God is bigger than you. We're going through the catechism with my daughter, and the first question is, who made you? The answer is, God made me. The next question is, what else did God make? God made everything. God made everything, and God is not made. That's why he says he cannot be crafted with stone, with gold. God cannot be made. He is bigger than that. And God cannot, does not dwell in houses of wood or stone. God does not dwell in our temples that we build. He doesn't dwell in our altars. He is bigger than that. And God demands that we worship him. This God is bigger than you. He doesn't need you, but He demands that you worship Him. That's as far as we get, but we're too far off. But He says, God is now commanding men that everyone everywhere should repent because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom He determined, having furnished proof to all by raising Him from the dead. Hear that, all of you. You will one day stand before the living God and give an account for your life and you will have no excuse that will satisfy the living God for your rebellion. God does not dwell in temples made with human hands. God needs nothing from you. God is holier than you. And God will not abide your excuses as to why you willfully lived in sin. There will be a day when you will be judged in righteousness, and it's a perfect righteousness. It's not my righteousness, righteousness, which falls short, which can be corrupted, which can be compromised with. It is the righteousness of the perfect, holy, living God. And you will have to be perfect and holy as the living God. And we know this because that judge was crucified on a tree, was laid in a tomb, and was raised by the hand and Spirit of God three days later as a testimony that this is your judge. This is my beloved Son. But that's not all. If that's all we had, we would be most pitied, most pitiable. We would throw up our hands, we would tear out our hair, we would fall on our face, and we would curse God because we would be dead in our sins. But praise God that the judge who will judge you it said of this as well, 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. We are ambassadors for Christ as God is pleading through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. How can you be reconciled to this perfect judge? 
Because God made him, his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the only righteous, perfect one who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. That beloved son of God, that perfect son of man, that promised son of David, that perfect holy judge, the precious, the only precious son of God, the one that has dwelt with him in eternity that was never made because he himself is God and the one that demands your righteousness because he is perfect became sin on behalf of his people. Do you understand that? No, you don't. There is so much depth. We are going to spend the rest of eternity. Sorry, Brad, I was waiting for it. We're going to spend the rest of eternity. This is the thing that angels long to look into. They want to look over the shoulders of God to see what he's doing in redemptive history. Now, to Brad's credit, if you're born again, you get a little bit of it. That's the beauty of the gospel. But this, we cannot, this is why the gospel is for the saved man. Because it's a balm to us. It's a cup of cold water to us. It's bread. It's communion with God. That you deserve hell. Now. You deserve to die and to be thrown into a pit. And forgotten. Like Jericho. Like the cursed man who would bring a false gospel. You deserve to die. And if the Christians here were thrown into a pit of hell. We would say God has done right by me. Except this. I thought Christ died for me. I thought it was enough. I thought he took my sin. I thought he became sin on my behalf. I thought I was righteous. Not what I've done. But I thought, Lord, I thought you were speaking for me. This is all I have held on to my entire life. Is your word on my behalf. That's the gospel. That's the gospel of faith. Because, dear friends, no Christian, no saint will ever be thrown into a pit and forgotten. No saint will ever have to give uh, an account for his sin. Why did you do this? All you will have to do when it comes to that judgment before the living God is look to Christ. Amen. Great God. Do not think that you will look to Christ in the day of judgment if you are not looking to Christ right now. Right. If you're trusting in yourself, if you're trusting in your, jo- your doctrine, if you're trusting in your experiences, now dear friends, I don't spurn experiences. We must see and know the living God. But that cannot be the object of our faith. If you trust in your experiences, if you trust in your doctrine, if you trust in your works and your good works, if you trust in your love and zeal for the Lord, you're deceived. You must trust in the living God alone. This one, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. How do you become the righteousness of God in Him? It's not a single thing you can do. The Lord Jesus must do it for you. The Lord Jesus is the priest. What did the priest do? He sprinkled the people with the blood of the Lamb. The Lord Jesus made the sacrifice Himself. And He is the priest who must sprinkle you in the congregation clean. What must you do? You must believe that He's willing. You must believe that He desires to cleanse sinners like you. You must believe that His cleansing does not fall off, that you can be made dirty again. You must believe that He's not only willing to save you, but to keep you. And you must go to the throne by prayer and plead with Him to cleanse you and to keep you. And don't get up from there. Don't wait 10 minutes. Don't wait 30 minutes. Go back and go back until you know that the Lord Jesus is willing to cleanse you. That's what living faith is. We rest in nothing of our own but Him alone. And verse 10 of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Am I seeking to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a slave of Christ. We are now slaves of Christ's saints. And we are His ministers. Even if you're not ordained to the ministry, you are, as it were, in 2 Corinthians, as Paul said, ambassadors for Christ. And you must plead His cause. He will plead through you. So, we as Christians, we as ministers, as ambassadors, should desire to please God alone and not men. 
But why? Why do we desire to please God? Here's the trap we always fall into. I want to please God. And it eventually gets to the point where I want God to be happy with me. There's a difference there. Do you see the difference? We want to please God. Not to earn favor, but because of the favor He lavished on us in Christ. As a child, your, your child wants to be near to you. Your child wants to be with you. Maybe not all the time. Maybe they get a little tired of you if your child's like my daughter. <laughs> she wouldn't give me a hug when I left today. So Sometimes, no. She wants you. You know, Whenever I go to leave, I go to work. Kata, she says, Daddy, pay me upstairs. She wants to be near to you. She wants you to be happy with her. She, wants you, you know, she has a trampoline, and she, I'll be eating dinner, and she'll get up and leave, and she'll say, Daddy, watch. And she's just jumping on the trampoline for half an hour. She doesn't even look at me. She's saying, Daddy, watch, because she wants me to see her. She wants me to be pleased with her. Not that I would love her more because she loves me and I love her. And it's much the same in this way. We desire to please God not to earn favor, but because of the favor we have lavished on us in Christ. We love because He first loved us. Because He does love us, so we love Him. Because Christ has purchased this love for us, we now live persevering and doing good, seeking from God glory and honor and immortality. And that is the life of the saint. How do you persevere in doing good? How do you seek from God glory and honor and immortality? It is, as we talked about in the prayer meeting today, being immersed in this true, pure, living, righteous, exclusive gospel. Let's pray. Father, bless the preaching of your word. There's nothing that I can do to change a heart, to save a soul. There's nothing that I can even do to encourage my brothers and sisters with any kind of lasting encouragement. It must be you. So please do this. Please minister your grace to us. We need you, Father. For those of us who don't know as much as we need you, make us to know our weakness, that we would know that we need you. Please come.